Okay, next time, Pastor, please put the um, pulpit up when I come onto the platform. <laughs> put it in the middle. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, no, no, don't talk back to me. I'm the speaker now, so now you have lost control. You've done your little thing. Amen. Just get out of the way. It's me and the Holy Ghost and you. Amen. Aren't you glad that, uh, amen. When I come back my, in my next life uh, on the earth, I will also have red shoes like that. And uh, uh, <laughs> Okay, it's great to be here with you guys. Um, you've heard his version of the story. Um, I still don't understand how you can fly to a city and you go to a prayer conference and you land up at the World Series and it's only America that's playing in the series and they call it a World Series. That's something we don't understand coming from other countries. It's the NFL World Series. Where is the world? They are not here. Come on. Anyway, so I will forgive you for that a huge mistake, but um, let's get that over and out. This morning, I'm going to talk to you about Catch Peter. Tonight, I want to talk to you about storms. Uh, you say, well, we don't want to hear something negative. Well, you need to hear about storms. Um, uh, if, if there's not a single person here that has never gone through a storm, and uh, even Jesus went through storms, and um, sometimes storms can be the breeding ground for something good. So uh, come tonight is going to be powerful. Um, tomorrow night, maybe I will talk to you about the day when God will exalt you. You say, well, that sounds strange. Well, I've got scripture for that. I'm not referring to a prideful spirit. I'm talking about a moment that God will empower you. Uh, and uh, I don't want to say too much about that because I'm not sure whether I will speak about it, but that's what I think now. And normally, I change my mind, so don't, don't bargain on that either. Um, catch Peter. How many of you know that God has one desire, and that is to get a grip on your life? Thank you for your response. Uh, it's going to take us forever to get through this service if you're not going to respond. So please, I like people to respond. I'm from Africa. I like people that, that will respond, okay? So just act like you are African-Americans like myself. And, uh, and when the Holy Ghost comes on me, I go black. So the reason I'm white is just to get into the white churches. But once the Holy Ghost comes on me, I go black. So be careful, okay? Uh, I'm just white as long as you can handle it, but uh, amen. Thank you. You love my humor. It's all I have. Okay. I want to talk to you about Catch Peter. When I talk about Peter, uh, you will notice that God, Jesus, focused on Peter a lot. The Bible focused on Peter a lot, and the Lord uh, prompted him a lot. How many of you know that sometimes the Holy Spirit prompts us? Uh, and the prompting of the Holy Spirit is part of our lives. And when the Holy Spirit prompts you constantly, it's because the Holy Spirit sees you in the future and He's preparing you for something. Now, Peter was the same, and there's a lot of ground here to cover, and I'm not going to go into all the Scripture references. But let us just start with a familiar Scripture in Matthew 16, verse 15 to 18. It says, And he said to them, But who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, you say, well, we all would have answered that question correctly. Well, you must understand, we were taught the Bible, the New Testament, Old Testament. But in those days, uh, when, when Peter said, you are the Son, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, that was powerful. Because they were waiting on the Messiah, and uh, that's what Peter said to him. Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. There's a difference between people that heard about Jesus and people that know Jesus. And um, my Father revealed this to you. And also I say to you, Peter, on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. So when he said on this rock, the name Peter means rock, but he did not mean I'm going to build my church on the name Peter. I'm going to build my name on that revelation. Peter, you have a revelation that I am the Christ. 
And I want to say that any church that want to be built on strong foundations is a church that must be built on revelation knowledge. Because the rhema, the, the Logos word as it is written, is not powerful. It is the rhema word. When the Holy Spirit comes and he revives the word, he, re, he revives the Logos, it becomes rhema. Um, you know, that's why... A, a, you can teach theology and lose the whole crowd because the, unless the anointing revives the, 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 the theology or the logos, the Word of God, it's not lively. So um, that is Peter. Let me just have, give you a glimpse of Peter when he was still not uh, the apostle that we find in the book of Acts. How many of you know that we all have a walk with the Lord where we were not 100% dedicated to Him? We were trying to find our feet. Uh, and I want to show you Peter. Um, and then I want to show you Peter in the book of Acts. So there's two Peters. I want to see you when Jesus is done with Peter. And when Peter was still walking with Jesus, but he, was still, he had a lot of shadows in his life. Um, and then I want to have a look at and see how did Jesus get a grip on him and, and, and so forth. So I hope that what I will say will help you this morning. Uh, Peter was rash, hasty, and an irritable man, a man of anger, at times firm and loving. That sounds like a guy that does not have his ducks in a row. Again, he was rash, he was hasty. He was angry at times. He was an ear cutter. Come on. So th th that's the first thing. I, I, I want to highlight a few bad things about him. He's, he's in heaven. He can, he can do me no harm. If I go to heaven, I'll just confess. But um, I'm preaching the truth. That's who he was. In Luke chapter 22, G we know the story that Peter denied Jesus three times. Now, if you deny somebody, that's huge. I mean, if you turn your back on somebody and put a spear in his back, that speaks of your character. He was a, den a denier. He denied Jesus openly three times. We will not go into that. Matthew 14, um, when he was supposed to walk on water, Jesus called him a man of little faith. Oh, you, you're just a man of little faith. Not one of us would like it when Jesus said to her, you're a person of little faith. Uh, and that's what Jesus said to him. So he's a man of little faith. In Matthew 15, he mistreated foreigners. Just that, I mean, just a few things that I've mentioned thus far. Peter will never receive credentials in the Assemblies of God. They will never allow him to be a minister of the gospel. What a mess. I mean, a denier? No, we don't want pastors like that. How can you give somebody like that a pulpit? Well, uh, in Matthew 26, and, and again, we're not going to go into detail. When he was supposed to pray, he fell asleep. What a hopeless person. He just fell asleep. Uh, in Mark 10, verse 13 to 16, he did not really care for children. Oh, my, that's huge. That, in America, that is huge. If you don't care for children, no, 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 sir. We cannot even consider you for ministry. There's the back door. Just leave uh, because that speaks volumes of your character. And um, then when you <laughs> study the Word, you will also see that he was a guy who had a tax problem, did not pay his taxes. Hmm, that says a lot. If you have never paid your taxes, don't raise your hands. We don't want to know about that. Well, he didn't pay his taxes. That's Peter. When you look at Peter in the book of Acts, you find out he's the chief apostle. You say, well, how did that happen? Well, that's why we are here this morning. We are here so that God can get a grip on us. Uh, he was the chief apostle. Many times when the Bible mentioned the 12 disciples, the name of Peter is mentioned first. 
Very interesting that his name pop up first, Peter. When you read the scriptures, you will also see that, the Holy, that, that Jesus, Jesus was on his case all the time. And uh, in Acts chapter 2, uh, you will notice that uh, he's the speaker on the day of Pentecost. The 12 apostles were all there. The 12 disciples, 12 apostles, they were all there. Bible calls them 12 apostles. But he was the speaker. 3,000 people came to the Lord. So it turns out that this denier is now the speaker. Well, we would not have allowed that in our day, but this happened in the days of Jesus, in the days of the Holy Spirit. He was the speaker. In, in Acts chapter 3, and we're not going to go into this, uh, it was the hour of prayer. And verse 1 says, uh, everybody came to the house that day. It was the hour of prayer. And when Peter came to the house, the hour of prayer, uh, there was a man at the gate of the temple that, that was paralyzed. And the Bible clearly says they brought the man to ask arms. The Bible does not say they brought the man to pray. No, they didn't bring him to pray. They brought the man to ask arms, but it was the hour of prayer. Can you see the conflict? That church allows a conflict. It's the hour of prayer, but they put somebody at the gate to beg for money. Because they realized, let's use the church. The church people are sensitive. Let's milk them for money at the door, but it's actually the hour of prayer. I don't want to preach about that. That's a powerful word for the body of Christ today. Peter showed up, and he's at the gate. He doesn't walk past him. Peter said to him, silver and gold I don't have. What he's actually saying to him is, I'm a traveling ministry, and the offerings was not good lately. I mean, nobody will see that. I see that. Come on. That's my perspective on that verse. Come on. Give me some feedback here. Anyway, what did he do? He said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, one breath, one sentence. It's almost like he says, silver and gold I don't have, but don't feel sorry for me. I do have. What did he do? He resurrected the man, picked him up. The man walked with him into the temple, and they joined the hour of prayer. That is no, it's no wonder he's now the chief apostle. You see, true apostolic ministries restore the order. I don't want to preach about restore the order either. But that's Peter again. You will also find out that uh, he wrote first and second Peter. He wrote two books in the New Testament. You say, well, how on the earth is it possible that the first few glimpses of this man is so bad and the last few glimpses is so impressive? That's why we are here. Catch Peter. When you go to Luke chapter 5, and I think I've ministered about Luke chapter 5 here previously, but let, let us just revisit Luke chapter 5, and then we're going to go to John 21. Do you have time? Thank you. In Luke chapter 5, we learn about Peter and the disciples, and the Bible says they caught no fish that day. And in verse 2 says, and Jesus was standing at the lake. Verse 1 actually says, Jesus was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats standing by the lake, and the fishermen had gone washing their nets. It doesn't say Jesus saw two angels. It's not a spiritual moment. Jesus is here looking at an everyday picture in your everyday life. God knows every scene of your life. God is watching your everyday life 24-7. He knows exactly when you had a bad day. He sees everything. He saw two boats standing by the lake, fishermen gone, washing their nets. That's what he saw. And the moment Jesus saw that, he decided, this is the moment I'm going to catch my man. 
this is the moment I'm going to get a grip on that guy called Peter who denied me three times. I'm going to get, get a grip on him. You see, God is not waiting for Sunday morning to get a grip on you. God's going to get a grip on you in your weakest hour, in your moment of failure, in the marketplace somewhere. He's going to show himself so strong that you will come back to church and say, Pastor, you will not believe what happened with me. Something happened with me in the marketplace this week, and I'm a different person now. Thank you for your excitement. He got into one of the boats. Now, I don't want to talk about the different boats because Peter, Peter was the main business guy here because the other disciples, and you will read it later on, the other disciples were partners with Peter. So he was the main business brain. Jesus is Jewish. He knows how money works. So he focused on the guy with the money. I hope that does not offend you. Come on. He focused on Peter, and the Bible says he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and he asked him to put out a little into the, uh, a little into the, uh, into the water uh, uh, or away from the land, and he sat down, and he taught the multitudes from the boat. So now Jesus is taking the boat of Peter, and he teaches them about his kingdom. That's all the Bible says. Bible says did not, did not say what he taught, just he taught about the kingdom. That's all it says. Verse 4, when he had stopped speaking. So the Bible does not record what happened there, what it did teach about. It just says when he stopped speaking, watch what happened now. You see, the focus is on Peter. That's why I call this thing catch Peter, catch Jim, catch Andre, catch Naomi, catch your name. Put your name in there. Come on. He's here to get a grip on you. And, um, and Jesus said, launch into the deep and let us, let us go for a catch. Why did he go? they go deep? Because Jesus was not in the mood for sardines. Sardines. Did you hear that? How many of you know you don't catch? You can catch sardines in the shallow waters. No, no, no. Let's go deep. He's taking Peter's boat deep. Now, remember, they came back. They caught nothing. And um, let's go for a catch. Catch means get a, get a grip. A, a, a catch means to capture something alive. Capture alive. To catch, to capture alive. How many of you know that God can give you a grip on something that could slip away? You know, fishermen's stories is always about the big one that slip away. Jesus said, let's go for a catch. Let's go for a catch. What did Jesus mean by that? Jesus meant to catch fish. But Jesus had more than one catch in mind. Come on. He will help you to get a grip on money in the marketplace, but he's actually focusing on you. You're focused on the money. He's focused on you. Watch this. But Simon answered and said, Hey, Master, we've told all night and we caught nothing. So now, now, now Peter brings into the story his bad experience. Oh, Lord, we, we, caught, we, we told all night and we caught nothing. Jesus, I was on the ocean the whole night. I know I have a tax problem. I need to pay my taxes. I cannot pay my taxes. I told all night. You only told all night when you have a money problem and you need to work every hour to get the money. And then he caught nothing. But then Jesus shows up. Before the tax man shows up, Jesus shows up. Aren't you glad that Jesus can show up before the tax man shows up? Amen. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody said it's very strong on my left hand side. May be some tax problems here. Amen. I I'm not sure. I'm not sure why, it, why the response was louder. But anyway, <laughs> be careful. I, I, I even listen to the volume. <laughs> Amen. Okay. But Simon answered and said, Lord, we caught nothing, but at your word, I will lay down the net. Now, I don't want to go into detail here. Because Peter said, I will lay down the net. Jesus said, take nets, plural. Peter said, I will take a net, singular. When you work with Jesus, you better take everything you have because he's the God of more than enough. El Shaddai is his name. It means more than enough. God is not the God of barely enough. Okay, that didn't work, so let me try something else. Um, 
They caught, and when they had done this, he caught a great number of fish, and the net was now breaking. Now the net is breaking. There's a singular net again. So, so Peter, changed the, uh, Peter tr- tried to alter the word of God. I mean, God, I know you're overexcited, Jesus. You want to take all the nets, but Jesus, what you don't know is you've never caught fish. I am the fisherman. You are the theologian. So don't you come and teach me how to catch fish. I have the big boat here. I'm the main, bra- main fish, fish brain here. Well, sometimes we operate like people that have fish brains. And uh, so I'm going to take one net. I'm not going to take all the nets. Well, big mistake. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and the net was breaking, so they signaled to the other, bo- the other boat. Remember, there were two boats in the beginning. So they signaled to the other boat to come, and, and, f- and they filled both boats so that they began to sink. So now both boats is sinking. I like it. Both boats is sinking. The, the, the boat was made out of wood. Wood speaks of humanity. The boat was created by man. They built the boat. That was their idea, their vision, their dream. We all have boats, visions, structures, dreams. But when God comes into our boats and our structures, it's normally too small. Because we all have brainchilds of what I want to accomplish, how I want to do it, when shall I do it. But when Jesus comes into our brainchild, uh, normally our brain, our brain idea, the idea that came out of our brain sinks. So they had two boats, two brainchilds, two boats, two structures, two dreams, two ideas of what they can bring out of the ocean. And Jesus said, I'm going to show you something that's in my ocean that you did not know about. God says, I want to show Transformation Church something in this ocean, in this area that you don't know, even know exist. How many of you know that God can bring things out of this area, this zone, this ocean that will just surprise all of you? That's the, sorry guys, I'm talking about the creator of heaven and earth. I'm not talking about a eeny little, a little tiny God that sits on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a, whatever, on a, on a shelf somewhere and you call that God. I'm not talking about that kind of God. I'm talking about the creator of heaven and earth. I'm talking about the creator of the, of, of the, of the ocean. Anyway, so they signal to the other boat and they both sink. I love it. Now Jesus is sinking. He's in the boat. He's sinking. There goes your salvation. (laughs) Now watch this, verse 8. When Simon Peter saw it. It's very interesting. The Bible doesn't say, and when James saw it, when Mark saw it, when Luke saw it, when Simon Peter saw it. Remember? He is the prominent guy. When Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, depart from me for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. So now he confesses sin. Nobody preached, no scripture references, he just confessed sin. When he saw fish, when he saw provision, when he saw an amount of fish that they could never caught ever before, he confessed sin. When he saw the goodness of God, he felt He doesn't deserve it, and he confessed sin. The goodness of God will lead many people to salvation. Come on. God is going to pour out his goodness that some people will say, I cannot argue anymore. There must be a God. How many of you are ready that God can bring such blessings into this region and this church that you will have to admit this is not us. This is not Jim Balzano. I mean, he cannot do this. This is the creator. At work. That's what happened. So now watch this. He fell down. Thank you. Finally, I got a response there. Thank you. Can you do that a few times when I'm preaching? Thank you. That'll help me. And um, I'm a sinful man, O Lord. And uh, for he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which, uh, fish which they had taken. And also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Can you see there? Who were partners with Simon. Simon Peter is the prominent guy. And, um, and Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on you will catch men. 
So there we have the word catch again. So Jesus said, let's go and catch fish. Later on, Jesus said, hey, Simon, now we're going to catch men. He's changing direction now. You see, he's focused on Peter because he already, he already saw Peter in the book of Acts. Remember, Jesus is God. He knows everything. He knows the future. So when he messes with your boat today, he already sees you in the future. When he messes with your fishes today in your nets, it's not because he just wants to bless you to feel better today. He already sees you preaching the gospel in Acts chapter 2. He already sees you in Acts chapter 3. Come on. Now watch this. So I love it. First Jesus said, let's go and catch fish. Then Jesus said, hey guys, now we're going to catch men. You see, for, for, for Jesus, it's not about fish. The, the amount of fish that they caught was actually money. How many of you know you can only eat one tilapia at a time? But when God gives you hundreds of fishes, the rest is money. Because you beat it, especially those days, you better sell it because you don't have a fridge. Come on. In, today you can keep your fish if you have a fridge. They had no fridges. I can promise you that. I don't know what they did, but they just sold it. Okay, so now watch this. So when they brought in the fish, the Bible says they were all astonished. Jesus is standing there. The fish is coming in. The boats are sinking because the boats cannot, the boats were not built for that kind of a blessing. The blessing was bigger than what the boat can carry. So, the blessing is now beyond their thinking. And they were astonished. And the, Jesus realized, if I can get them to the point of being astonished, I will catch Peter. I will help him to catch fish he's never seen before coming into his world. And the moment I help him to get a grip on fish, I will get a grip on him. And once he got a grip on him, he said to him, now let's go and get a grip on men, people. There's three catches. They caught the fish. Jesus caught Peter. <laughs> and then he said, now let's go for the bigger picture. Basically, Jesus said, now that we have the money, let's go on a mission strip. It's right there. Everybody say, catch Peter. You see, I've learned in my life, my own life, that the prompting of the Holy Spirit is sometimes, and it will never go away, is sometimes God prompting me, preparing me for something greater. So what Jesus did is he came into Peter's boat and he made some changes, on it, and, he, and he impacted Peter. Now, let's go to John chapter 21. Jesus was resurrected. And in John chapter 21, it's the last chapter before the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus is resurrected from the dead. He was about 33 years old. He's resurrected from the dead. The disciples have an incredible respect for him now. There is 40 days between the resurrection and the ascension, and then the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. 40 days is a long time. Why? I think God the Father allowed it to be 40 days so that there will be enough testimonies that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. 
Because if the ascension took, away, took place one day after resurrection, they could have made a story up and say, oh, he was never resurrected. The body just disappeared. No. Because in, in John chapter 21, it was the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples. It's now the last time. It's, it's, it's almost over. The third time that he appears to hear them. And how many of you know that Jesus now completed his journey on the earth, is going to go back to his father, and Jesus is now doing the final touches. He's doing the final preparations. He's going to ask the final questions because he's, he's now preparing his church and his future apostles for something great. When you, when, you, when you go prepare for Bible school and, and you prepare and, and you want to go into the ministry, normally those days in South Africa, they will call you in and they will say, now, Andre, tell us, how do you know the Lord has called you? Do you have a day that you can tell us when God called you? Can you give us a scripture reference how God spoke to you? Tough questions. Well, here we are in John 21. Jesus is about to give the baton to the 12 disciples and is about to hand it over to them. His mission is almost completed and he's still focused on that one man called Peter. And I feel in my spirit every time I think about this, I feel in my spirit we have come to such a moment again where God is saying, I'm going to hand off the baton one more time. And I'm preparing my apostles, I'm pre preparing my church for another launch, for another outpouring of the Holy Spirit, for another invasion of the Holy Spirit. I feel like our generation needs to take responsibility because we've come along or walk with the Lord, but it's about time that we have another John 21 experience. And John 21, it says there in verse uh, uh, 3, uh, it says, But Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Give me another half an hour. Can I have another half an hour? I mean, you took more than an hour for praise and worship and announcements and making fun of me. So now I want to take an hour, hour and a half. So when Simon Peter said to him, he said to him, he said, I am going fishing. There's Simon Peter again. Now watch this. Simon Peter is the guy that initiate the fishing. Let's go fishing. He's the guy, let's go fish. Let's go catch money. And Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. And then when they went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. Nothing. God loves it when you catch nothing. We all have seasons of nothing. That's when he steps in. He loves it when you're at a low. He always comes when you're at a low because that's when you are sensitive. That's when you, are, you have an open heart. And they caught nothing. And, uh, but, when, uh, but when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore that the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. So here we have Jesus, third time. He's now appearing to the disciples. He's on the shore. He's watching them. They are in the water. And Jesus said to them, children, do you have any food? I love it. Jesus was a food guy. Children, do you have any food? Watch this. Be careful. For him, it's not really about food. For him, it's not really about fishes. For him, it's always beyond on the other side of the food and the fishes. But he'll, he will always start with your everyday need. He will always multiply your bread and, and do your everyday need first. But he's always, he's always targeting you for the bigger picture. Jesus said to them, do you have any food? And they said, no. And he said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. It's amazing. We are sometimes close and we think he's gone. In the meantime, the catch is just to the right and not the left. So they cast and they were not able to draw it in. You see, Jesus is involved again. They can't draw it in. Wherever he's involved is almost too much. When they delivered the man in the Old Testament, but Jesus, God said, pick up, don't, pick up what you need today. Tomorrow I will dump some more. Thank you. 
that night, that is, uh, therefore the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now remember, remember, remember. Jesus is resurrected. Third time he's going to appear to the disciples. They're catching fish. This man is standing on the shore. And uh, I think it was John said to Peter, he says, It is the Lord. It is that guy that came out of the tomb. It is the Lord. Immediately the atmosphere changed. Because they knew he's bigger than death. They knew he's got marks in his hands. They knew if he's on the scene, it's not just to catch fish. There's something bigger. You're at a meeting here this morning where it's not about a speaker. There's somebody standing at the shore watching you, prompting you. Come on. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, John, said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard this, that it was the Lord, Simon Peter. Can you see Simon Peter? His name is the prominent name all the time. When Simon Peter uh, heard th that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he had removed it, and he plunged into the sea because he now needs to impress Jesus. He's a difficult guy to work with. But the other disciples, you see the other disciples is almost separated from this name Peter. The other disciples came into the little boat. They did, they did not jump into the water. It's almost like Peter is the one that felt, oh my goodness, I feel unholy. I better put on my top, my top part of my body, uh, cover my top part of my body. Oh, can you see how he focused on Peter? The scriptures highlight Peter. They were dragging the net. And as soon as they had come to the land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it. Fish laid on it. So Jesus was a big fish eater. And bread. Watch this. So Jesus already had a fire going and he had fish and bread on the fire. Jesus loved toast. I've got another revelation for you. It was not salmon. It was tilapia. I was disgusted when I heard that. And I figured that out. But now, one of these days I will switch over to tilapia. Not yet. But it was tilapia. So he had fish and bread on the coals. Watch this. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. So what he's saying to them is, bring some of that fish. He had some fish, but not enough. Bring some of that fish that you have just caught. I mean, come on, you guys. You just caught that fish. Although I help you to catch it. But I will not say it because I don't want to offend you and make you feel bad. So I will, I will say, the fish that you have just caught, you know that you did not catch it. I helped you. I told you, go right. But I will treat you as if... You got a grip on it, although I know I helped you to get a grip on it. But bring the fish that you have just caught. Bring. Bring fish. Simon Peter. Simon Peter. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net. Simon Peter was not the only one that dragged the net. But Simon Peter dragged the net. Can you see how prominent Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to the land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Oh, again, the net was not breaking. It should have broken, but it did not break. How is this possible that these things happen? And it, it, it doesn't make sense because my common sense tells me the net should have broken, but the net doesn't break. Every time he's close by, the net don't break. Every time he's close by, the sub sink, but sink, but we don't drink, we don't drown. It's strange when every time he's here, these things appear, the miraculous appear. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. I love it. Come and eat breakfast. Jesus invite them for breakfast. 
It's John 21. It's the final chapter. Jesus is inviting us again for breakfast. Jesus is inviting the church for breakfast. I sense in my spirit, it's time for breakfast. But be careful. When you do breakfast with Jesus, he's going to ask some questions. It's not only about fish. I, I, I warn you, it's not only about fish. It's too late now. You cannot get out of the service. <laughs> Yet none of the disciples dared to ask, who are you? They knew who it is. I want you to, see, church, I want you to see the picture. I want you to read the clock. I want you to see it's the third visitation after the resurrection. Acts 2 is coming. Jesus is busy with his 12 students, 12 future apostles. He's going to hand over the church into their hands. And he already know that they cannot proceed without the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus realized, this is my dying moments on earth. I want to make sure about a few things. I want to check a few things. I want to make sure that I'm handing this thing over into good hands. Do you have another few minutes and Jesus came and he took the bread and he gave it to them and likewise the fish and now this was the third time Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead and when they had eaten breakfast and when they had eaten breakfast I think everybody was ready to go home Jesus said to Simon Peter But now you're sitting there in your pew and you say, why is the Holy Ghost messing with me? Don't worry. I've got the same problem. He's always messing with me. Even now. Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Tell me what do you understand about the word the eschatology? Peter, how well do you know Greek and Hebrew? Peter, tell me, how do you prepare a sermon? Oh, Jesus, you just go to Google. He is so different. He's not preparing Bible students. He's preparing 12 apostles. You see, those are the questions that they ask me. When I wanted to go in Bible school, they all had black suits and white ties, and they were holy men of God. In the meantime, they were all religious people. They are all dead by now. I can talk about them. They irritated me those days. Thank God those days are over. Jesus is different. He's asking the questions because he sees the future. He sees Acts 2, Acts 3. Simon, uh, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. I think Peter must have said, oh, thank God. Whew. That was an easy question. I've answered it right. Oh, thank God. He's now done with me. I think he's going to zero in on John. Oh, I think he's now going to ask Matthew theology questions. Thank God it's over. <sighs> wow. I think I will... <laughs> I will now get a church somewhere in the country, somewhere. He said to Simon, verse 16, again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, remember, they just ate breakfast. They're sitting in the smoke. 
They had toast, not French toast, Galilean toast. No bacon, no sweet stuff. Second time, Simon, son of Jonah. Oh, Lord, another question. Another question. What can this question be? Do you love me? Love. Love. He's asking me whether I love him. Oh, God, I denied him previously. My God. Why doesn't he ask me theology? Why doesn't he ask me how to cut ears? Why doesn't he ask me how I treat foreigners? Same question. Is he nuts? Well, he already asked me that question. Why is he asking me the same question again? Does he think I'm stupid? What's going on here? I should not have come to this breakfast. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, tend to my sheep. Every time it's about lambs and sheep. It's about people. It's not about agendas. It's not about programs. It's about people. Oh, the church is not always about people anymore. I've met some people in the pulpit. It's not about the people. It's about other things. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, Simon, Simon, I think Mark and Luke and they were sitting there and they thought, this is a strange breakfast. Why is he zeroing in on Peter all the time? Why is he focusing on Peter all the time? You see, when he looked at Peter, when he asked him the questions, he could not tell him, Peter, Peter, if you only know what's coming. Peter, I am Christ. I am prophetic. I know the future. Yesterday, today, forever, I am the same. I am the son of God. I'm about to go back to my father. But my mission is almost completed. But Peter, I'm going to give this baton into your hand. Do you love me? Love me. You see, church, at that point... God proved his love to them. He died. He's resurrected. It was a bloody mess on the cross. He sits at the breakfast and his hands has marks in it. They have the greatest respect for him. This is a holy moment. I can feel it. And the modern day church don't like these moments anymore where it becomes so holy and the presence of God is thick and we are exhorted as a church. Do you love me? He said to him, Lord, you know all things. I think Peter is now concerned. He said, Jesus, you know all things. Come on. Are you here because of a guest speaker? Or are you here because you love him? Am I preaching the gospel because I need an offering? Am I a man that's chasing money and do meetings for offerings? Or... Do I really love him? That's a question not for you, but for me. Come on. I've got good news for you.
Peter never denied Jesus ever again. Peter always prayed. Peter always believed. He cared for foreigners. He cared for children. Peter was even crucified upside down. When they wanted to crucify him, he said, do me a favor. When you kill me, crucify me upside down. I am not worthy to be crucified the way they crucified Jesus. After John 21, Jesus probably said to himself, I think my church is in good hands. I caught him the day in his own boat. I got a grip on him in his own business. I got a grip on him when he had a bad day on the ocean. When I was 17 years old, he got a grip on me in an old hut on a conference, a property of the church on a Saturday afternoon. He got a grip on me. And I want to say to you this morning, he's here to catch you. We all have seasons where we denied and we were shallow in our faith and we were little, we had little faith and, and, and we cut some ears. You say, no, 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 Pastor Andre, I have never cut anybody's ears. I'm not talking about with a sword, I'm talking about with your tongue. Not you, but me and some other people, we've done that. How many of you say this morning, Jesus, catch me? If you say this morning, it's almost 12 o'clock, I know. 12 o'clock is the time that things should go back to normal. <laughs> Some of you say, just hang on, 12 o'clock is coming. He's got no option. He'll have to let us go. And then we can slip out of this grip. Come on, you guys sitting there with your special hairdos. Who is that friend of mine that took some pictures of pastor's shoes this morning? Oh, there he is. You like his shoes? I know you want to get a grip on his shoes. But Jesus said, I'm going to get a grip on you. And you know, sometimes he will give us the shoes. Or he will give us the fish. But the moment we got the shoes and the fish and the hat. And I saw somebody here this morning that had a thing that hang out here. Looks like a belt. There was a guy here this morning that made some announcements. He had a reddish shirt on. With, uh, there he is. And I, I see your belt was hanging down here, brother. Uh, it, it looks like he, he was on his way to put in the belt, but forgot. <laughs> I think he forgot that uh, next time you must put the belt around your waist. Then it will not hang down here because I said to Naomi, I said, I said, I think, I think he was in a hurry this morning because he forgot to, uh, thank God your pants still made it. <laughs> but you know, sometimes God says, I'm just teasing you, son. God says, I will let you get a grip on the right belt and the right shoes and the right color and the right head and the right fish. But I'm actually after your heart. And I thank God he has your heart. He's got your heart, and he's about to get your heart. He's about to get you, sir, and all your friends sitting there with those special kind of hairdos. Uh, hallelujah. I know that comes normal. How many of you say, Lord, 
we are all Peters. We all have that kind of background, but we all have a book of Acts coming. And Jesus said, all I want to know from you, do you love me? Because if your love comes in alignment with heaven, all the other things will come in alignment. It's not what your hairdo look like. It's not what your belt look like. It's not what your shoes look like. It's, that's not important. You see, Jesus couldn't care what Peter has done wrong in the past. Peter would never have been an AOG pastor. Never. But Jesus made him the chief apostle. How many of you say, there's hope for me to become that person that God wants me to be in my immediate future? If you believe God is still busy orchestrating the catch on you, he's, he's going to do something in your everyday life to tighten the grip on you. Will you just stand on your feet and just say, do it, Lord. Catch me. I've got an older woman that was on her feet first. Isn't that amazing? Come here, ma'am. I want you to come here. I want you to come here. Hallelujah. Are you from this church? How old are you, ma'am? 75. You have a little bit of a limp, I see. You have trouble with your feet. She was the first one that stood up and said, because I know, I didn't ask the question, but thank you for the answer. Because I know there's so much more he wants me to do. If you're 75, you don't care if I say the age. It's too late now. They know. You see, when they're at that age, you don't care. But you know what? If you're 75 and you still feel like, get a grip on me, Jesus. Get a grip on me. Jesus, I still have an Acts 2 coming. Jesus, I'm 75, but I still have an Acts chapter 3 coming. If she still feels that she, she's got that Acts 3 coming, how about all of you? How many of you say today, Lord, invite me for breakfast. I'm having breakfast with Jesus for, for several weeks now. Oh, I love barbecue. I love coals. I'm from South Africa. That's our tradition. I love when fish is on live coals and steaks and lamb. And when the coals, and oh, I love toasted sandwiches on live coals. We make it in Atlanta. It's a Capetonian thing. And there's tomato on it and cheeses and, and onions and some other gravies we put on the toast and Oh, and you put butter on both sides and you prepare. It's, it's like a piece of cake. God knows exactly how to catch me. Invite me for barbecue. You want to do breakfast? Children, children, come for breakfast. It is in the moments that looks very ordinary. It is in the moments of your life that look so ordinary. Oh, it's just breakfast. That Jesus said, I want to talk to you. I'm going to prompt you. Jesus was in the boat with the fish, and here they are around the fire. And again, Peter say, why is he focusing on me? Why is he asking me three times the same question? Why is he looking at me that way? Why doesn't he talk to Mark? Why? Why doesn't he leave me alone? I don't want to answer more questions. I don't know what's going on here. You see, church, he's prompting you. You don't know your future. All you know is something is 
prompting you. You say, I, I, don't, I don't know what my future looked like. All I know is something is happening inside of my spirit. How many of you have that prompting right now? You say, man, I, I just sense God is not done with me. He's busy with me. He's busy with me. It's because God says, I see you somewhere in the future. And you already know what I'm going to say. And you look much better than you look right now. Say it again. I'm somewhere in the future. Everybody say it. Say, I'm somewhere in the future. And I look much better than I look right now. Everybody say this. All I have now, do this. Say, all I have now is the prompting of the Holy Spirit. But all I know, say, all I know is this is the confirmation that I'm somewhere in the future and I look much better than I look right now. Father, I pray this morning that you will empower your people, that you will strengthen your people. I pray this morning that you will uh, 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 s- uh, restore the love relationship between us and you. Lord Jesus, we know that you cannot prove more love. But Father, we say this morning, we love you. We will feed the sheep. We will feed the lambs. We will take care of business. Lord, I thank you that you do not remind us of our past. Watch this one more time. Watch this. Watch this. Jesus could have said, are you good with children now? Will you deny me again? No. Aren't you glad that Jesus said to him, Peter, 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 amazing. He called him by his name. You see, you see, the devil knows my name, but he always calls me by my sin. But Jesus knows my sin and my failures and my weaknesses, but he always calls me by my name. He knows your past, but is going to call you by your name because God knows if your love is at the right place, the past will never repeat itself in your future. You will never deny again. You're a chief apostle. You're the preacher on the day of Pentecost. You're the resurrection, the one that resurrected the dead, uh, the, the, the lame at the gate, and you will maybe even write books in the future. Ha! Say this one thing, say, with His help and His grace, I am a success story they will hear about in Jesus' name. Amen. Give God praise.